Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our latest installment of the MPF webinar series. And we're delighted to have two really great panelists uh, who you will get to know in the next hour. Uh, Fred Esposito is the COO at uh, Rivkin Radler. Uh, he's in Long Island, but seems to spend a lot of time in Maine as well. So, Fred, glad you're here. Thank you very much. And Tom Obermeyer. Tom is the CEO at SurePoint Technologies, formerly Rippy and Kingston. And Tom based in Cincinnati, Ohio. But uh, I suspect you're not in Cincinnati today, Tom. Good guess, John. <laughs> Where might you be? I'm in uh, Naples, Florida. Oh, nice. Very nice. On the lanai overlooking the Gulf of Mexico? In the no, in the, uh, in the laundry room next to the garage, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not <in> much more... <laughs> uh... And my friend and colleague, Uri Gutfreund, who's been uh, my partner in crime all year presenting these webinars. Uri, good to see you as always. Good to see you. There's no crime here. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> keep keep moving, people. Nothing to see. Keep moving. Uh, really, thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, your time and your preparation for today's uh, webinar. Uh, we've been running between 120, 200 registrants. Today's no exception. We have 121 registered. So good crowd. Uh, timely topic as we look to next year and the budgeting and a lot of uncertainty. So we bring to bear two experts who know a lot about law firm finance, uh, both on the revenue side, the expense side, and we're here to offer some guidance, some suggestions, how to tackle the budgeting process for the coming year. Uh, so we are at the top of the hour and uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, get our formal introductions going and uh, off we go. So thank you again. Uh, welcome to today's program, everyone. Uh, I'm John Remsen, been running the Managing Partner Forum for about 20 years now. And uh, we often do live conferences, not happening this year. Hopefully we'll get back to it next year. We do a little consulting on the side. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I'm an MBA type like, uh, like Fred and have been working in and around law firms for uh, 30 years. I used to have hair uh, uh, back when, and, and my partner in crime, Uri Gutfreund. Uh, I also Uri, used to you... hair. <laughs> yeah, I think Tom and Fred got us in the uh, hair category there. <laughs> Uri, you got an exciting here. program set for tomorrow. Why don't you tell us real quick what that's all about? And it's not too late for people to register if they want to show up, right? The, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, John, we are doing the Managing Partner Virtual Summit tomorrow, which is really exciting. For the first time, we have breakout workshops where people will be able to real time choose their sessions on all kinds of important topics. Again, like today's session, planning for 2021, business development, marketing, strategic planning. John Remsen's given that one and other important topics. So, uh, yeah, we're really excited and people can feel free to follow up with me. Happy to give them the login to uh, join us tomorrow. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you, Uri. We look forward to that. And uh, Uri's invited me to co-host and work, uh, present one of the breakout sessions. So that should be a fun program and uh, looking forward to that. And uh, Uri, always good to have you and work with you on these programs. Uh, enough about us, our guest speakers today, more importantly, Fred Esposito. And I've been an admirer and observer of Fred's work for a long, long time, uh, mostly through ALA where I've seen him speak about KPIs, law firm finance topics. Uh, but Fred's out of Uniondale, New York, uh, Long Island, the CLM involved in Lean Six Sigma. He's gonna tell us a little bit about that and uh, runs the finance column, Law Practice Magazine, and uh, been working in and around law firms for a good long spell. So Fred, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here today. And joining us, uh, and I did this in alphabetical order, uh, is Tom Obermeyer. And I had the pleasure of meeting Tom live and in person uh, a couple of, well, this was before COVID. I think, what it was it, uh, last fall, maybe? I uh, happened to be in Cincinnati uh, and, and uh, uh, through a mutual client. Uh, you got to meet Tom while you're in town. And it just worked out. So we had a chance to get acquainted, went out and saw his shop. And... Uh, uh, thought immediately of, uh, of Tom when we, we talk about budgeting and, and law firm finance. So, Tom, uh, 
why don't you tell us what this Deutsche Bank scab narbs is? It, it just begs the question. So I, I, uh, well, first I'm saying I, I, I tend to have more hair than John and Yuri, which probably indicates I haven't dealt with law firms enough. Um, but I, 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 you know, I used to be a thinner guy, so I do have some some legacy problems with uh, with dealing with the legal legal tech industry. Uh, I began my life as an attorney at Skadden Arps, right? Worked there for a number of years. Uh, from there, I made a complete shift uh, into finance, becoming a risk manager at bank, uh, and then en route to being a um, chief risk officer for Citigroup, global markets and banking. Uh, I made the natural shift to be technology CEO, say that tongue in cheek, uh, at a company called RDC, owned by Sachs at the time. Repackage it and be sold it to Moody Analytics, and now I'm happy to return a little bit of a home to the legal space and the legal tech side. I'm looking forward to uh, similar success in uh, in the legal tech industry. And uh, how long you been at uh, SurePoint now, Tom? I've been there two years. I joined in October of 2018. Beautiful. Uh, you know, have expanded uh, the presence of the company, doing quite well. Thank you, and uh, uh, and really have taken from the Midwest more nationally, right? So big presence in the East Coast now and on the West Coast and in the Southeast where I am right now. And you're running the Florida office, I see. Of, uh, the Florida office you're looking exclusively at. It is a, a very elegant uh, eight by four room. Um, and <laughs> we do a lot of work here. It's funny how many of these uh, law firms have Florida offices, uh, <laughs> and and the, you know it's often driven by an equity partner who has a place in Boca or or in Naples. <laughs> but uh, Tom is simply uh, doing this part to cut expenses. That's you know, well, in this day and time, we can do things virtually, right? We're starting to figure yeah. that out. We'll get through our opening remarks. Uh, people love the survey data. We'll present some of that to folks uh, to get us kicked off, sort of set the stage invite Tom and Fred to offer some comments. We are keeping them to five minutes. And Uri's got the, uh, the, the, the if, uh, if <laughs> folks run long, people really love the interaction among our panels. So we wanna make sure we carve out most of our time to dialogue. We've got your questions when you're registered. We're gonna throw in some polling questions and Uri, walk three people through real quick how to work the chat box. If sure. they come up with a question as we go. Sure, yeah, this is unusual. We already have people posting questions to us already, which we'll work into the program later. So we got a hungry your, crowd. <laughs> we do, we do, we do. Thanks, Steve, maybe. I love your question. So uh, on the on the panel, there's a place where you can have chat and you can have questions. If you can please uh, put your spa your questions in the questions panel, that'll make it easier for us to integrate it into the program. It's easier, easier for us to manage that. So I'll be monitoring that uh, throughout the program. And when we get to the discussion, the group discussion, I'll certainly work it into our discussion and, and we'll take it from there, John. Uri and I have got this down. You know, <laughs> I handle the live audience polling and Uri handles the uh, chat box and the questions you all provided us when, when you registered. So we really try to tune in and make this as interactive and fun and lively as possible and leave folks with some good benchmarking data you can share with your partners, your executive committees, whoever you choose. Uh, law firms really like the data. There's our future of law graphic we have to have in there uh, to kind of set the stone, uh, tone for the future of law. When you registered, we asked what you project to be the average revenue per lawyer next year compared to this year's actual numbers. And uh, here's what you told us. And Tom, is that surprising you? Not at all. I, I, I think we're feeling the same way and, and our community of about 600 law firms in the, in the mid-sized space is feeling the same way that next year will be better than this year. I think there's a trend, worst case scenario about the same, but that, this is what we're seeing. And you mentioned as we were in our plenary that it's the second half of next year where you're projecting a real boom. Yeah, I think, I think you business. know, as we were talking about, to me, it, it feels the advantage of being old is you see the same movie over and over again, right? Uh, and uh, the curse of having an undergraduate economics degree is you're very gifted at predicting six of the last two recessions. Uh, but putting all that together, sort of look at at, at this as being more like 2010 than 2009, right? So, and, and by that I mean is everything is sort of flattened out. It started to trend upwards slightly. 
And then we're starting to see a lot of build for three quarters to a half of the year of 2010, 2021. Okay. okay. Uh, Tom, does that uh, data jump out at you or is, is that what you might have predicted among Fred. firms this size? I'm sorry, Fred. For me? Quite frankly, I'm, I think it's right on target. Um, I think there, because there is so much uncertainty still, and I also think when you're looking at these kind of responses, we have to take into consideration the size of the law firms that are responding to these to get a real apples to apples idea of what we're looking at. I think a lot of firms, I'm not shocked at all about being about the same. I, I think a lot of firms are gonna take a very conservative approach, um, especially with their expenses at this point. Um, but I, I definitely think you're going to see opportunities, as Tom suggests, that later in the year, presumably as this thing starts to settle out, um, consumer confidence, all the confidences are gonna come back, businesses are gonna try to come back, and they're gonna try to come back quickly. Um, okay. And I think you saw a little bit of that in over the summer as the COVID numbers started to sub subside a little bit and people were trying to get back into the swing. What is interesting about this stat that I will say is, we're at a point in time where everybody thought gloom and doom in April, and they didn't know what they were going to do, and they did all these different things to prevent, and the natural re, re, you know, knee-jerk is to cut expenses. But oddly enough, a lot of law firms did quite well this year, and some did even better than they had in previous years. Yeah, we learned that firms uh, claim to have adjusted very, very well to this. And, then, and I think oh, you're 25% in there. retaining their productivity. Uh, yes, and certainly among at the partner level. Some are doing that and some are actually exceeding that because it's created as always in, a, in any kind of a downturn in the economy, regardless of where it's coming from or, or originating from. It, uh, depending on the law firms and their diversity of practice groups, it's going to create opportunities in some areas and maybe some deficiencies in others. Um, okay. But it's those others that make it happen. Let me flip to uh, the, the, the rest of the uh, results to your questions as you registered. We asked about uh, on the flip side, on the expense side, uh, what's your projected overall budget for your support staff? This is 119 mid-sized firms. Uh, our sweet spot is that 25 to 150 lawyers set. And uh, support staff, you know, overall a, a very modest decrease. Uh, collectively among these firms. Here's the here's the mover, technology. And the uptick as firms work more remotely and embrace technology and all it can do for us. Uh, that is a real, I mean, that's dramatic right there uh, in terms of uh, the uptick in investment in technology. Where are we going with our marketing budgets? And uh, a little bit of uptick there when you net it all out. But now is not the time to be slashing your marketing budget. As you said, Fred, this is not knee-jerk expense slashing mode, uh, but thoughtful, strategic, long-term uh, in terms of how we uh, look at our expenses and where we're investing. So, you know, if I may just add one thing to that, to what Tom had said, you know, having been through this cycle before in 2009, 2010, I was about 14 at the time, but <laughs> I do remember being on top of this. And the bottom line here, which is really interesting, is that when it comes to being year old, huh? I tried um, marketing and business development, you know, just like the last time, and Tom can concur probably in 2010, business development was a main focus even then, because it was a, it was really a differentiator for law firms and their success moving forward. That was one, I think that was one of the after effects of the last recession that we had. I well, agree, I think Fred. The thing it, here it, is, it, it, you know, the, the old corporate moniker is probably true that, uh, you know, shrink to grow only works in a McKinsey deck, right? It doesn't work in real life. I mean, you, you've got you've got to invest, and, and marketing is a clear, clear tangential route to success. And of course, it's how we're spending those marketing and business development yes. dollars because we're not flying off to conferences and we're not whining and dining clients at fancy events. Uh, but but there's other things we can do to maintain relationships, build reputations and the like. And we may get into some of that uh, as John, just a comment and, and a comment on this slide, John. What I'm hearing from a lot of firms is the reason why their marketing might go down 20 percent is when we ask them how they did this year, a lot of them have extra money in their marketing budget. 
Right. They don't know how to spend it. You know, right. this isn't a 2010 where they turned it off and turned it on. They're learning right. now <laughs> how to spend it. So I think that's that's a big factor. You know, they say yeah. they're going to spend more money. If they don't learn how to spend it, um, they're not going to spend it again next year. So that's my hesitation on that last slide. Well, it's, it's the webinars. It's the, you know, virtual virtual outreach, yeah. I think. And um, teaching your lawyers how to use these platforms. Um, you know, your, your people need to look good when they're on camera doing the initial consultation or taking a deposition or or whatever and and you know why not Uri? you've been working on your branded background for your <laughs> webinar i'm not that sophisticated <laughs> quite yet but uh hey how your people look and present on a camera yep. and the lighting and the sound and all that good stuff is important um, you know john it lends to, i'm only gonna make one quick comment it lends to the concept of firms looking at their kpi different kpis especially exactly. as it relates to marketing and business development because as you just described the traditional business development models that firms have adopted for years, I think, are going to definitely change going forward. And I think you hit it on the head. Webinars, more virtual, everything virtual. It's going to turn, we're going to be looking at different metrics in terms of measuring success with business development going forward. Great. You know, the social media component to it, I think. Yes. And it used to be just random, random acts of lunch and golf. You know, that's what we did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> golf. No, random. <laughs> random. Yes. There's no focus to this. I just feel like. Sort, of, sort of like my shots, John. Yeah. I mean, this is about <laughs> tech enablement marketing, right? I mean, that's where we got it, where, where. This industry, one of the last to adopt, it's going to right. How do you enable a technology-driven marketing campaign? How do you follow up? How do you get all that that tied into a social media campaign? How do you get that tied into an electronic prospecting campaign? Uh, the technology there is really great; it hasn't been adopted in this industry yet, but right. it is it is coming in spades. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, uh, let me move along here. Boy, there's so many places we can go off tr off tangent and, and, and just great conversation. And as, as these things end, Pete, it's over already. We could have gone on for a half day <laughs> on this topic. And it, yeah, we probably could have. This, there's a lot here and it's uh, hopefully you'll come back for more. Um, our first audience polling question. And uh, this is one we ask all the time and mostly for the benefit of uh, Tom and Fred, and that is how many lawyers are at your law firm? And uh, say we usually are right in uh, that mid-law space and vote early, vote often. Uh, I live in Atlanta where the election is not over. <laughs> Interesting to see what happens in January. And uh, let me close this and reveal and here's who we got, just to give you a sense of firm sizes represented today. And uh, let me go ahead and hide that and move on. And Fred, why don't we, uh, excuse me, Tom, uh, why don't we uh, get you to kick us off? And uh, at that macro level, what should managing partners at Midlaw be thinking about right now? Oh, building off the trend, and I'll show some stats in a second. I mean, what, what I'm trying to accomplish here in my initial remarks is, is how do you go about planning for 2021? How does the managing partner think about it? And, you know, when you think about planning and planning on the top line and the revenue side, you always think of the funnel, right? And the way to work through the funnel, you want to think about macroeconomic circumstances yet. Things are getting real good, right? And, and I would say I'm not even tempered a little bit. My customers, of which there are about 600 mid-sized firms in the U.S., uh, are not really worried about potential shutdowns coming from the spike in the COVID situations. You know, let me just say, obviously, this is a, a grave tragedy to those affected and a grave concern for everybody. And and the economic circumstances ever around. I'm, I'm not trying to brush that aside. And, and my thoughts and prayers are with them. But what I'm saying is, looking at the vaccine acceleration, looking how the economy has recovered since the drop in March. 2010 is going to look very good. It'll be a ramp in the first half of the year, but the second half of the year will start to take off. That, that's clear to me. I mean, just look at economic history of the U.S. from, you know, economic expansions where quarter, where you have consecutive quarters of 7% or better GDP growth, which we now have. Look what happens over the next two years. Quite impressive. And so take that into consideration when you start to think about that. Right, that's starting to reflect the products a law firm sells. And here, 
I always go, these are not motions to dismiss or complaints that are filed. These are practice groups area, areas. We're seeing strength in litigation. We're seeing renewed strength in intellectual property. In fact, we are seeing a wealth of practices, um, not only a startup from a legal sense, but also in representing startups taking off. YP is doing very, very well. We're seeing most corporate transaction firms doing quite well. We've even seen a comeback in commercial real estate. Some of that's more of the workout variety, but it's back. Yes. Uh, and it, and it, and it's good to see. So most of the product groups are getting very robust. Your clients will talk a little bit about that, but please make sure you budget your line by client, by existing client. The easiest place to turn to to grow revenue is to never focus on, which are the existing client base. We're all focused on growing new relationships and the like. That's important. But think of growing your client relationships more. We'll talk about that. And look at attorneys, right? I mean, it, it's sort of funny, you know, speaking with Fred and speaking with John and Yuri, you know, I, I come from more, I mean, starting as an attorney where it's very cautious and still very gentlemanly or ladylike in terms of developing somebody. And when do you say goodbye to somebody? To being in a technology space now where basically you get a quarter to prove it, right? And, you know, either either you know it in a quarter, you don't. And I Goldberg, who founded Survey Monkey, uh, a great mentor to me when I started out in the tech space. And he, you know, he said to me, Tom, think of your career. Was there anybody who you thought wasn't going to make it in 90 days that suddenly became something afterwards? And cleaning this up and cycling out people faster than than usual is something law firms need to need to speed up, in my opinion. Um, so focus revenue too, not only on practice groups, but by attorney as well. And that will feed to some of your KPIs as you go through. Let's talk about the Sherpa community. So these are the 600 customers we have, 601, that are between 25 lawyers and 253 lawyers, right? I factored out the lower end of the equation. I factored out the upper end of the equation. And because we're a cloud-based operation, we have the ability to accumulate on an anonymous basis all the information that we have. We look at hours billed by week to see how we're doing. And this is the entire crisis across those 600 law firms from hours billed by week against the two-year average. There is a gray or silver line in there, fluctuating back and forth of the gold line. That is 2018, 2019. 2020 is represented by the blue line. And you can see it started out negative, dropping quite precipitously into April to about 20% down, 17 to 20% down. Then it's normalized down to single digit growth. And any economist will say, when you enter a recession and the growth rate is now sustained, somewhat flat, but still sustained trending up wise, you got to think about market expansion, not market contraction. So this tells every manager, managing partner in a law firm, based on this statistic, that it's time to think about growth, not retrenching. I think that's important from a revenue side, and that's an important aspect to it, right? So that's the one sort of tail I have on the on the macro side. If you go to the next slide, John, I, I, yep. I think from from this perspective, now let's talk about the top line, right? There's that bucket of existing clients which are often ignored in this process i'm amazed how many clients tell me that you know what is your client engagement get client portals we talk about intake billing collections improving that rate to get flow in get a client portal absolutely interact on everything get it set up get it put up the other thing right now is go to if you're a managing partner go to your executive take credit cards as at that portal, credit cards, quick cash, all of it. Get that portal so you Bitcoin. can. Bitcoin. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Oh, Bitcoin. Right. Hey, think you're a little aggressive, John. Right? I mean, that's, that's subject to another. <laughs> depends on who your another, clients another, are. Uh, Representing you know, wealthy South Americans. I, I want to say, from from my personal perspective, there's nothing to matter with fiat currencies. I like <laughs> the dollar's still good. We're we're fine. Um, but I think you know one of the things that that is often ignored is get. You know, this is not necessarily NPS studies on a year to hire a firm to come in and do this. Get to Survey Monkey, get to one of the survey agencies, te teach your administrative assistant to send out regular one or two question hits, mm -hmm. get feedback. I mean, I, I run a technology firm, but I look at my customer satisfaction service is the first thing I look every morning up. How did we do? I get that feedback regularly. I don't think a law firm should but it should establish more regularly, bi-weekly, fortnightly, uh, quarterly for sure, customer surveys. Are the clients happy as they go through it? I mean, that's really, really critical. You know, Tom, we asked that question over the years. Do you solicit client feedback in any way? And it's shocking 
how few firms do. Yeah. And, you know, that to me, I mean, existing clients are where it's at. And, exactly. Uh, and that leads to community importance, right? You know, law firms and tech companies are very similar. Right? And I run tech companies now, used to be a lawyer, in the sense that it's really about a bunch of intellectual property that sits in people's heads and their clients, right? And that's really what the unique aspect of. That means you've got to create as a law firm a community, right? The community is your clients. The more clients feel engaged and that they're part of something larger than themselves and they're not just a revenue ticket <coughs> to you, that will get you greater engagement and greater business from them, right? So, you know, how about, how about Tom, a client advisory board? And you could do <laughs> that at the firm board. level, at the practice group level. Um, Every no brainer, but I can't tell you how few law firms, they, they think that's crazy talk. Client environments, even within clients, John, yeah, if you yeah. if you have a great client with multi-direction, you run their IP practice, you do run litigation, do some transaction work, even if you're a small mid-sized firm, get a client, not clients, client advisory group, get different parts together so you can really show off to everybody the strength of the relationship you have across the client, um, which works, works pretty well too. And this is important. Also think about those events. I know we're gonna get hopefully back to more physical presence. They could be virtual now, but getting an event together, an annual IP conference or whatever, and getting your clients to speak to other clients is the best way to start selling this, yeah. right? And think yeah. about systemic relationship pricing. I, I gotta tell you, you know, every bone in my body, having come from Wall Street into technology now and having known so much of what the practice of law was like 25 years ago, Nothing's really changed. It's all ad hoc pricing. Make that systemic, make that approachable. And this is not, you know, sort of the one billing aspect. I think the one place that I'm really impressed by our clients is their embracing of subscription pricing model, particularly for, for new starts <coughs> or new startups that just says, hey, here's a $8,000 a month fee. We'll handle this amount of work for you. It's not a one-time success fee or it's not a one-time budget and limit it to that. It's like, get that recurring revenue in the door because in good times or bad times, they're contractually obligated to pay. That makes everybody sleep well at night. <laughs> and quickly on the, you know, that tech driven marketing machine, there are great aspects <clears throat> and great products now out there on prospecting. <clears throat> machine will do the prospecting for you. You've got to spend about two weeks teaching machine what to look for and it will go find it and do it for you. Same on the classic Salesforce, Mercado, HubSpot aspects. I often joke with a lot of my clients that law firms tend to be the best clients for Salesforce because you pay a fortune for it and nobody loses it, right? It's like so, the gym membership in January, right? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a gym membership. Get, get there and, and focus. Uh, I know there are a lot of pandemic related transactions that are very timely now, you know? related to the pandemic, well, whether, whether something's force majeure or not, it, it's, I've read more scholarship on force majeure than I had in 25 years being a lawyer previously. <laughs> but I think, I think, stay positive, how to get out of the, the prospect. Uh, as someone who ingests a lot of law firm marketing, you know, negativity you sort of read interesting, yeah, 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 but the positive aspects are what you read, right? Nature. And so you want to read about how to get over the pandemic. So take take that change away, and and I think you'll get there. Tom, um, I have a quick I have a quick question. Just Steve on our on our questions asked and just relevant on point. Tom, you pointed out that Salesforce uh, is not the right CRM for many law firms. Perhaps it's too complicated. I'm not sure. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But what? But the real question from Steve is is what is the best CRM? If your law firm doesn't have any CRM. Uh, and Fred, you could pop in too if you have a suggestion on this, but what what, what one or two should they consider? And John. Thank you, Larry. John and Fred, I, I like Salesforce and I think it can be killed pretty quickly, but you got to pay attention to it. And there are okay. a couple of upstarts, uh, Cuz and a few others that are up there that, that just started to be law firm-like CRM systems. I'm happy to give you a full list, but I, I'm interested to hear from Fred and John who spend a lot more time in CRM than I do. Brad, why don't you uh, take that one quick and uh, yes. I'll from a CRM standpoint, we are working with interaction and yes. it's working very well for us. We are also, and I'll talk about this at some point, it's we are basically taking a hard look at how we're using interaction from a CRM standpoint. 
Um, we're making sure that during our client intake procedures, we're capturing all of the pertinent marketing information that we need to know, the demographics, uh, the types of businesses we're working with, so that we can promote business development initiatives among the attorneys within different practice areas, uh, cross-selling initiatives and things of those natures. Right now, we're probably, um, we've been with it about two years now, and we are now taking a hard look at it, especially now as a result of the pandemic. Uh, interaction is a fine product, customer, yeah. professional services firms. I, I tend to look at interaction more focused toward big law firms, at least 100 or more lawyers. It's not inexpensive. It's very robust, a lot of bells and whistles that a lot of firms just don't use. They're barely scratching the surface. Um, contact ease, uh, Cole Valley is uh, geared toward mid-sized law firms. I have a lot of clients who are satisfied mm -hmm. with that. Uh, there's Salesforce, there's Act, there's a bunch of them out there. Some firms will just use Constant Contact or MailChimp and maintain yeah. their databases within those bulk mail service providers. Um, um, but um, yeah, there's plenty of them out there. Do your research. What I've seen over and over again, firms will spend north of six figures on a CRM system that the lawyers won't use. Correct. These are my clients and Correct. I'm not willing to share them with the firm and with my partners. And that speaks to a cultural issue. But yes. before you go buy the CRM, make sure your people will share their information and and yeah. and, and 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 will cross sell and and work as a team and share. Define, define and agree to a strategy before anything, right? Yes. Technology is never pure. Get it get it right, get it agreed on, and then buy the system that works for you. Okay, Tom, I don't want to shortchange you, uh, so let uh, let's ask you to just briefly share with us what what you'd like to kind of kind of get managing partners thinking about, and then we'll go into some uh, conversation, take questions, and that sort of thing. I, I think everybody's got to shift from panic mode to learning how to work remotely to how to grow the business given what's going on, right? I, I think that's the number one topic. I want to get everybody focused on growth and away from retrenchment right now. So get your growth pants on and go out there and go get it. Fred, I'm sorry. I keep I keep calling Tom Fred and Fred Tom. I'm just uh, well, we've, we've uh, memorized each other's Fred, presentations. Fred, so it's we, your turn. <laughs> um, you know, before we go any further on the slides, I mean, I want I want to talk a little bit about the expense piece. But before I begin, the the way I would want to preface this is first of all, it's still a revenue game, no matter how we look at it. And I think that Tom has done a great job in pointing out that that the need for growth and business development is imperative, and it is going to be critical in differentiating your, your law firms from your competitors. It's gonna be very important. The other point I have, and I wanna put this on a t-shirt this year in 21, is called disruption brings opportunities. And I think there are definitely a lot of opportunities for law firms. And as we get into the expense side, I just wanna mention, know your firm's economics. I cannot stress that enough. There are a lot of firms that really, when asked, can you tell me what it costs you to produce a billable hour? cannot answer that question. And that's where firms got in trouble back in the last recession when every when AFAs came about, everybody went back to historical data and they tried to do what they had to do for pricing. The most fundamental difference I find going into this pandemic is all of those symptoms from the last one are here. But the benefit is we have learned to further develop and enhance our skill sets in doing more strategic pricing. Law firms have hired project managers. They've hired pricing directors. Um, they're hiring administrators who have strong uh, pricing background. So that is always, that is basically one of the permanent changes that we've come forward with. Um, but one of the things I would mention as far as expenses go, I think a lot of firms are uncertain and they're going to keep their, they're gonna to try to keep their general administrative budgets fairly set from the, from the current year. But be, keep in mind of all the savings firms are building up independent um, without even really watching too closely. I mean, your office expense numbers are coming down. Mm -hmm. um, you're finding also that your occupancy costs to some extent, firms that are coming up on lease renewals are now going to be reassessing their space needs. Some are giving space back. Some are taking their existing spaces and they're restructuring them to make it more hotel space because 
now that lawyers have adopted this change management initiative and have moved to working virtually, I don't think it's going to change. I think you're going to see a lot of people who've gotten used to it. The productivity numbers, even in the information that Tom had presented, illustrate that productivity is sustaining itself and, and in some cases even improving. So, but when talking about you know, revenues, you have to understand how to contain your costs. And while the pandemic is contributing to a lot of cost savings, I think you can take a deeper dive. One of the things that I would add to this whole pandemic discussion, as well as what happened in 20, 2010 and 28, you know, 2008 and so on, is there is a new twist now. We now have to start taking project management and looking at it deeper and looking at how we are producing legal services. What are we doing that can be changed? What are we doing that could be more efficient? While by giving us more efficiency, client focus, and also the biggie, which has not changed since 2008, is the value proposition. And I think those are all things that we have to look at. The revenue line will always be the one that you want to watch, but your expenses, while they may be somewhat consistent from year to year, you now have an opportunity to look at those processes that you have in place in your firms to produce reductions and also give you better information when pricing work for your clients. For example, on this slide I've given you, I show you, we don't have the time to look at data. I think firms right now are caught up in this fire doom loop where I don't have time to get off the treadmill to see how we can fix these things. And if you look, don't worry, we'll get to it. You see the guys down there running with the square wheel and they're saying, yeah, we're fine, don't worry about it. I that's call that I the how... billable hour treadmill. You know, that's we get exactly caught up exactly. on the stuff and that's And firms are like, I don't have time important. to stop and look at these things. And that's why I keep saying disruption creates opportunities. And if we can go to the next slide, one of the things, that I really focus on in this new pandemic, new normal is process improvement. And we all you know, think about what is a process? And really it's a bunch of repeatable steps in sequence that generates an outcome. But we wanna be able to do that each time the same way, every time and get the same result. And that is where I think sometimes we run into problems in our profession because how many of you can say you have seven lawyers working on a file and then you have seven lawyers looking at the pre-bill and then you have seven lawyers looking and sending back drafts to billing and accounting? When you quantify the amount of wasted time that goes into that, think about the potential lawyer time that's wrapped up in all of that. Um, so, I mean, just as an aside to give you just an example of how delicate and detailed a process to get something done is, um, I can tell you right now, if anybody could guess how many steps are involved in making Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Hmm. People think, what's the big deal? You go in the window, you order it, they pour it in, they give it to you, you're out the door. You have the app, you, you, save, 30, you save two seconds. 94 steps are in the Dunkin' Donuts manual on how to make coffee. Every single detail. I'm not saying that if you miss step 88, you're, you're, you're done for and you're not getting a good cup of coffee. But the point is, they're repeatable steps. And our, you know, or you can go to the next slide. Um, process improvement, okay? You have to look, let's say you're, you're preparing motions. Let's say you're preparing other legal work in the firm. You wanna take a hard look at how you're currently doing it. You have to look at how it currently works in your firm. Are we doing it right? Are we staffing it properly? Are we leveraging it properly? And then looking and finding all the defects, all the problems in the current way you're doing it. And then sitting down and actually looking at data, looking at the data in your firm that you have and trying to identify all of the waste. And this slide here, I think it's in your materials. I think it's a very good one to look at. When you're thinking about cutting your expenses and when you're thinking about how to generate more revenue, take a look here at this list of examples of waste or defects we can all relate to this, missing filing deadlines, incomplete forms, bad drafting, data entry lab labels, overproduction, starting work before checking conflicts. That's a biggie. Um, waiting, people late to meetings, not returning client phone calls, transportation, sending things by courier versus email. These are all areas in your firms that can be looked at in terms of how you can reduce waste and costs in your firm, especially in the production of legal work. The 
ticket for this, as you go through this and you look at all these different ways of reducing your costs and becoming more efficient, is the investment of technology. Technology and business development expense should be looked at very carefully and very aggressively in 21 because but, automation you know, moves us. Fred, you know, that's nice in concept, but I'm an equity partner at this law firm and I'm going to do things the way I want to do things. And no one's going to tell me how to intake and no one's going to tell me how to track and bill my time. And I think it it, 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 we gotta think and act like a firm and develop firm processes, systems, procedures, and there has to be accountability and enforcement. Exactly. And that's where I think firms fall down. They'll set up the systems biggest, and these processes and no one's enforcing. I think the biggest area that hurts law firms is their client intake process. Yeah. The client moment intake of process, I mean, if we're gonna have a moment of truth, the client intake process is flawed in many firms. And I like the client intake process as an example of improvement because it involves and touches every part of the law firm. Yeah. It touches accounting, it touches billing, the lawyers are involved. It involves loading billing guidelines and it comes down to billing. Every piece of the firm is in that. And the, the ramifications and the risks of not having a good process in this kind of instance, just as in this example, John, missed or false conflicts because information is not captured. Okay. All right, Fred. So who's the enforcer? That's an, that's an argument for who's a the enforcer. Is it the managing partner? Is it the firm administrator? Is it the poor, you know, billing clerk who's being barked at by an equity partner to open this file, damn it? Now it, it's a, well yeah. I think it depends on the firm's culture, first of all. Um, but I think you're looking at somebody, if you're looking at a firm, 26 to 50 attorneys, I think you're looking at a managing partner and a strong administrator. Um, but it's but you have to also create technology guidelines in the systems that keep people on the right track to eliminate right. these errors and these problems. Because if you set your systems up properly, you eliminate those wastes and you eliminate those errors. And usually, John, think about it. It's the support staff that are working with these partners that are doing all this work. They're on the front line and, and if trying to make the equity with partner, partner happy, you know? If they've been dealing with this partner for years, I mean, I have people who I hear them yelling into their partners, you know, quiet, I'm trying to get work done. You know, that's the kind of relationships that some of these people have with these, with these partners. So I think you have to create processes that eliminate those errors or those opportunity for errors. And that's where you get the, you can, you can force the, you can put the enforcement in place. So, so Tom. Fred, what you're saying is, Fred, what you're saying is when you have an intake system, for example, you can't get, you can't open up a matter until it clears conflicts first. The system exactly. won't allow it. It won't right. allow it. It's that, when that, people that's try to bypass saying. fields. You know, they just skim through and they try to go through and then send it through and let billing worry about it. Somebody's got to be the enforcer. I work with little firms where they don't even have engagement letters with a client. They wonder why they can't get paid because your intake is so darn sloppy. No one's enforcing this. Yes. Uh, well, I think so, first of all, you have, to, you have to create the process in such a way that forces compliance and then you have the enforcement piece. Because number one, the file's not going to get open if it's not if they don't adhere to the process. And then the, the lawyer's going to complain, then they're going to come to me and they're going to say, well, I can't get a file open. Well, you can't get a file open because Karnak is not working in the billing department. They <laughs> doesn't know. Tom, let me uh, jump to you. You think the managing partner needs to get in here and be an enforcer? I, I'm going to put this one on making sure people are compliant with all these policies and procedures. John, I'm I'm on uh, I'm I'm with Fred on this, and I'll take the the blame on the legal tech side, right? This has got to be technology enablement up front. It is a lot easier to blame the system than it is mm -hmm. to blame the person. That's number one, right? And it and good luck trying to get the system to do something, right? So they'll complain about it. We deal we deal a lot with this all the time. It won't yeah. work. Something that get directed to Fred is en route to me about a managing partner screaming and mailing at me and the system won't open a file. So I'm good with that because I, those compliance initiated endpoints, which every other business has, technology enabled, needs to be so here. The answer, John, to, to your list of people responsible for it is all of them, yes, because it's the, it's the culture of the place. 
Yes. Right? The managing director should never take a phone call about the need to open a file because requisite information needed, especially for conflicts, or God forbid, docketing, Fred, is not provided. That, that call should right. never go to the managing partner. Never go. Because the answer is do it. Right? Do it. Just get it done. We don't right. open right. accounts in this firm without conflicts checks. Right. Because Right. Our, you know, our malpractice under, underwriters will go insane if that's the case. I, I, I'm with you guys 100% in theory, but when that big bad rainmaker with the $10 million book of business doesn't want to play ball with the firm's rules, so often we don't we don't go there. That 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 bully gets away with the <laughs> behaviors. I go you there. Know, $10 million rainmaker needs to know better, John, quite frankly. Right. <laughs> they, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think most of the rainmakers, and quite frankly, John, those kind of rainmakers have those executive assistants who are right oh, on it. Yeah. They're on it. I mean, because I mean, they usually have those kind of people. But uh, technology, as Tom says, I think has to set the guideline and the governance for it, and then the firm has to reinforce it. But, I like your idea of blaming the system. Well, it's it's the Absolutely. system. Well, everybody blames the system. the system. It's like, really, what do we pay for this thing for? It's supposed to make coffee. Nobody told me I can't get coffee. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's those kind of things. But All right. the point I'm trying to make here at the end, you know, we can talk about the empirical numbers and we can talking about re expense reduction. But at the end of the day, we are in a period now where firms have an opportunity to really look at innovation. And I think that Tom hit on that when he was talking about some of the revenue enhancements ideas. When you have a law firm that's just doing things the same way across the plane, and then you have clients' expectations, and still clients are in the driver's seat. And as clients are going one way and law firms are going another, there's a gap. There's a performance gap for the law firm. The law firm is failing the client. However, if law firms are responsive in the future and use innovation and use process improvement to create value proposition, as well as being focused on the client, and we're moving with the expectations of the client, for example, business development initiatives, doing what we can to increase that, that becomes more of a competitive advantage for the law firm. So there is Everybody has a has a stake in this. Everybody's a stakeholder in this. Even the ten million dollar okay. guy. Okay. And he wants to make sure he's getting the money he's supposed to be getting for right. that ten million dollars. And if you go to him and say, "Well, gee, you know, we're trying to we're trying to do what we can here to get you what you need, but you we need to work as a firm to make this paradigm shift happen." And the okay. reason I say it can happen is look at our industry. As I wrap this up, look at our industry. We had days to move into a virtual law firm environment. The change management initiative that occurred for law firms to move was extraordinary. Yes. I never, and I say much credit to the profession for that because a lot of firms moved quickly, of course had their bumps and scrapes, but they moved quickly. And quite frankly, if our profession can do that, I think our profession now can look at things differently now that we're virtual. And I can even say as a COO, even I see things now virtually that I would not have noticed readily being in the office or in any of the locations to see what's going on. And I was able to come up with some real quick fixes in the process. Fred, I'm with you, but we all know this, this change was forced yes. by an outside influence over which we had little control. Yes. And, uh, you know, voluntary uh, evolution and uh, self-improvement is a different story. Um, this is leadership, I believe. And I think as all this shakes out, there's going to be winners, there are going to be losers and firms that get it together and think and act like firms as opposed to collections, loose confederations of sole practitioners sharing office space are really going to uh, I think, accelerate and distance themselves. There's a hell of an opportunity here for firms that get it together. Uri, let's go to our, uh, I'm looking at the time and this tends to happen. We get, get kind of wrapped up in our opening comments and, uh -huh. and uh, cut ourselves uh -huh. a little short, but what you got questions from our audience or when sure. people registered that we want to toss in uh -huh. at Tom and Fred? Yep, L let's try and go lightning round. I'll ask uh, probably three or four questions. We'll go fast, gentlemen. So lightning the first round. one, the first one 
uh, is around uh, budgeting for next year. So uh, most firms use some kind of a process where they project and they call it different things. And I'm just combining a whole bunch of questions here. Uh, they call it a bunch of different things, goes by different names, uh, but people don't pay their entire bill. And we have to project that. Even if we're gonna have a certain amount of collections out there, there's a certain percentage we know we're not going to collect next year. So as we look at 2021, how would you recommend we go about adjusting that formula for 2021? And why don't we go Fred and Tom, and then we'll go to the next question, please. Okay. I think that historical data, with for, especially during the pandemic period, will mm -hmm. provide you information on the, the, if you have the right data, you're gonna see the collection realization. And you're gonna come up with a rate, an effective, recorded rate, an effective billing rate, and you're gonna come up with an effective collection rate. One of the things that I have found that is really interesting is that institutional clients throughout the pandemic, for the most part, have maintained their momentum in making payments. Um, I find it's the transactional clients where we're finding the difficulties. And you know, we as a firm do not do contingent work as, you know, as a rule. But unfortunately, sometimes these cases end up turning into just that because you end up accepting right. a fee that you didn't want to accept. But from a budgetary standpoint, you should be able to back into those percentages. Based on this past year. Based uh, on this last year, because I don't think you're going to see anything different unless Tom tells, some, tells us something different. My interpretation is it's not going to vary that much. Okay. Yeah, we, we have certainly seen collection realization numbers stay the same, quite frankly, Fred. I mean, they have a couple of basis points here or there, but yeah. they stay the okay. same. You know, that Fred's 100% right. It, it's collection realization and it's billing realization, right? Billing realization is how efficient, the, it's how much he actually works gets billed, right? How much it's written off before written off, right? Um, and then collection efficiency is how much do you actually, from the bill you send out, those are the two numbers you are. I, I recommend everybody use it. You know, use a four-month moving average, but but a year average from last year will be the same. I think that's going to stay. Maybe it improves slightly, not so much a collect, collection realization because it hasn't gone down, but maybe your billing realization will go up. There's a little tendency to bill everything that was worth. And I just want to add one little small thing to what Tom just said. I think it's also important to look at the historical billing realization since the pandemic because the problem with that is you want to make sure that people, because they're working remotely, are not just recording time Right. because they're trying to meet time deadlines and time billable hour requirements in the pandemic because that translates into larger write-offs reduces the billing and reduces the collection potential so i think by the way i just want to you have to look at that i i just look glanced at my uh watch here can, can you believe how our time has just flown by we've got about 10 minutes <laughs> uh, so uh Uri, before i we ask another question i just wanted to share this was our last uh, webinar, we looked at KPIs um, and, and productivity since COVID hit. And look at that, net partner productivity up slightly, some slippage among associates, uh, even more slippage among support staff. Interesting data. And firms are starting to rethink the KPIs they're looking at as we work more remotely um and and what perhaps want to measure other things client satisfaction people employee satisfaction people these are important indices we need to be measuring them and improving those uh so i just wanted to drop that in there i'm going to do two audience polling questions uri i'll kick it back to you and then we're out of time people love this Good benchmarking one. data so let me go ahead and uh launch this and as we launch this question I'm going to ask for a prediction from Mr. Uh, let's start with Esposito, and then we'll go to Mr. Obermeyer. So uh, you're giving your associates raises in 2021? I would, the quick answer I would say is yes. By how much? We put in our, the answers more than 10%, five to 10, less than I'm five. Say I'm going to say five to 10%, but I do have a mitigating circumstance because I'm reviewing attorneys on a 15 month basis this year as opposed oh. to 12. You, you had to throw that in there. Of course I did, I'd be remiss if I didn't. Uh, um, Tom, what do you predict uh, folks are doing uh, with associate I'm in, I'm in the same bucket. I think on, on average, it would probably be closer to five than 10, but it, yeah. it, it won't be unheard of that you know, some portion of a firm's associates gets greater than 10%. So on average, Ooh. I'm 
say about Boy, Seven. And you guys sound Good really battle. smart. Uh, twenty percent of the folks on the call aren't quite sure yet where they're going with associate salaries. Uh, it's interesting to read what big law is doing in terms of associate compensation and furloughs and salary cuts and the rest of it. Uh, then we're going to switch over and ask where you're going with support staff salaries in 2021. And as people are voting, please vote early, vote often. And uh, your prediction on this one, Fred, what are we doing with support staff compensation next year? I think as a general rule, we're doing less than 5% but we are going to have exceptions because we have some folks who actually really went above and beyond this year and we are going to compensate them accordingly. And we're also going to address some of this through bonuses. Not lockstep raises, performance driven no. raises. I like that. Driven. And Tom, what's your projection on uh, where we're going with uh, uh, our staff compensation next year? I'm, I'm in the same bucket, but I'm going to carve out the, the tech staffs who, by and large, across the middle market have been exceptional. Uh, Tom, in right. Tom, right. Yeah. There we go. And that's just a generic catch-all question, obviously. And we've got, you know, different sizes of firms from different parts of the country, parts of the world, for that matter. So it's hard to get a real, you know, uh, something that one size fits all, but uh, that's what we got in terms of anticipated raises for our uh, employees uh, next year. Um, Uri, let me come back to you. You probably have one more question or two, and then we're going to have to move to close. Well, this is a a, a process question that comes up. Uh, a few people asked it, but I think it's it's really excellent uh, for this, which is <laughs> firms, especially smaller firms, don't really have a very sophisticated way of coming up for their budgets for next year, frankly, in a big picture basis. So um, number it's two part question. Number one, uh, how do you come up with your budgets for next year? Do you do a three year average? Do you see what they did this year, bump up 5%. Uh, and then the second half of that question is, is there any tech, and let's keep it low tech, any low tech tools you'd recommend for this process too? Or is it just still, in Excel, which is what most firms, I think, are doing from these questions. I work with Excel, and okay. you know, I have historical data that goes back, dec you know, ten years. But what, and I can do a ten-year flow and come up with relatively average amounts of percent of total revenue of the firm by month. And I have a and believe it or not, over ten years, it is fairly consistent that in January we collect X percentage of our amounts of money. In smaller firms, depending on how many lawyers you have, if you have only a small group of lawyers, you can pretty much meet with each of those lawyers and get an idea of what they're anticipating they're going to do with their clients that year. Um, and based on that number, if you have the historical data, I'm a big proponent of that. Look at your trends because you're going to find that I know that I'm going to collect 10% of my revenue in this one month. And I have data that will support that. So I'll take that number and I'll float it through and then I'll add maybe a slight percentage uptick in it because I like to put cushion mm -hmm. in the budgets and I like people to be aspirational. You know, okay. so I don't want to make it too easy where everybody hits their budget by January or you yeah, know, a little or stretch March. there is not a bad thing. I like to I like to put the, the extra in it because I do believe there's potential not only in the billing for that current year. But people forget that there's that accounts receivable that you're dragging over with you from the year prior. And right. that money becomes found money and falls to the bottom line at some point. Okay. I agree. I, th I think it's a dirty rule, right? And, and I know many, many firms in the lower end of John and Uri, your target market sort of, sort of really don't have a very sophisticated process, right? Quick and dirty, last year's, last 12 months running, right? Look at it. Probably uptick at two and a half to three percent first half of the year, four to six percent second half of the year, and that should land. And then go back and reality test it with the partners. I think I think that's as a quick and dirty Fred is that you know obviously the more historical information you have, yeah. the levers you historical have, data is important. But I also think the partners, especially in a smaller firm, the partners right. have a pretty good handle of what they're going to do. You Agreed. know, you know, I know that you know the days of pricing where you used to say, well, it's going to be fifty thousand dollars to do this case. Those days are over. Yeah. Um, because it just doesn't work anymore like that. But I think that if you're in a smaller firm, your partners are pretty have good acumen. They have a pretty good idea of what they're going to deliver next year. 
And I think you need to back into those numbers. What I always do is a cross check between what my revenue budget comes up across the board. And I try to tie that in to origination for each lawyer so that it's zero, so it comes together. So I know where that money is going to come from. That's my cross check. Do we think we look at some of those productivity numbers earlier? And uh, I, I think we got some hoarding going on, some partners hoarding hours that should be pushed down. And that's something the managing partners should always be mindful of, uh, pushing that work down best we can. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, in this remote environment, people kind of scrambling to meet their minimum billable hour and collections expectations mm -hmm. may be holding on to stuff a little more than they should. Um, you know, this kind of list of stuff. Um, there's a real interesting article. If you haven't seen it, we'll include it in the handout materials. Journal of Accountancy came out yesterday uh, looking at some tax implications, year-end tax implications with the uncertainty of our politics going on. And if these two Georgia Senate races go Democrat, uh, there could be some interesting tax things going on. Uh, in terms of inheritance and capital gains, uh, if, if the Democrats seize control of the Senate. Uh, interesting article and some things you might wanna think about doing toward the end of the year. Um, we could go on. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, we got stuff coming up. Hopefully we'll do a live conference in May, see many of you there. In the meantime, we're, we're offering some virtual programming in 2021. Gotta pivot, don't you know? So we're going to be doing some virtual conferences. We're going to continue our webinar series, uh, which has been really popular and want to keep it rolling. Uh, keep in touch with our communities. We talked about some of that uh, earlier, our conversation this afternoon. <clears throat> so um, we could go on <laughs> for another two hours, I'm confident. But unfortunately, our time's up. Uh, Fred Esposito, thank you so much for your participation and your preparation for today's program. Tom Obermeyer as well, thank you. Uh, appreciate both of you guys. And this isn't the first, uh, our first time at the rodeo. We'll be doing some more programming. Uh, we may be doing a PPP loan deal here before year end. Uh, there seems to be some questions about where that's going. So uh, stay tuned, more coming up. Thank you for being with us, Uri. Good to see you. Uh, and folks, take a look at Uri's virtual conference, uh, seats still available. And Uri, thank you so much for your duties you, uh, this afternoon as well. Have I missed anything, Uri, for the good of the order? Just put the next slide up where people can contact Fred and Tom with more questions. Oh, our next slide. I'm a little overwhelmed. I'm a little overwhelmed. Let them reach out directly to them. We could reach out. You could read. You can call Uri and I too. We'll return your phone calls. Uh, but all of us are uh, willing to carry forth the conversation. You have questions, uh, want to follow up on any of the points made, feel free to reach out to Tom uh, or Fred or myself or Uri Gutfreund, and we will get back to you promptly. Uh, thank you so Thanks, much, Tom. everybody. We'll see you soon. Have a good Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll uh, we'll thank you again for your time this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye-bye now. Bye, Bye everybody.